I got a pretty good question on the forum the other day and in reply to some of the videos that I've done recently, which is a very basic, what is ZFS exactly? Like, you know, I'm a computer enthusiast and I want to know about ZFS or ZFS, the file system for storing files. I mean, I know people talk about it. It's almost like meme status at this point, but I'm going to try to, in very basic terms, explain what it does, why it's awesome, how it compares to BTRFS, other file systems that are available, and why it's different. I mean, there are things that make it similar to existing solutions, but there's also things that make it different. Let's dive in. I'm going to try not to be super philosophical in this video, although it helps me retain things when I have some insight into why things are the way that they are. And, uh, you know, ZFS is one of those things, it's almost like alien technology. It's almost like there's this random thing that was discovered uh, and then all of a sudden we have this magical technology. And the reality is that Sun Microsystems are the original developers of ZFS or ZFS. ZFS is, you know, because some people don't, don't say Z, they say Z, so ZFS, the letter Z file system. The reality is that Sun, in kind of their death throes, they open sourced it. And then Oracle gobbled up, Oracle, the database company, sort of gobbled up Sun Microsystems and their intellectual property and, you know, um, sort of put the reanimator juice in Sun for a little while in terms of hardware and that kind of thing. But you have to understand that Sun Microsystems was like, the uh, super secretive Ferrari uh, type computer company, way ahead of their game. They saw things before anybody else saw them. They saw things before they were really commercially viable. They were operating it at basically like, you know, an IBM or a General Electric or a Westinghouse level of research and development, but they didn't really have the uh, means to commercialize and capitalize on that level of, of re research and development. And with computers, this has pretty much always universally been true. And this sort of came out with my uh, interview with Greg Crow Hartman the other day. It's, computers barely work. They're, I mean, you look at it, it's like, no, no, a computer is, is uh, reliable. And a lot of magic has been done to make a computer appear to be reliable. But under the hood, it is a fantastic amalgamation of, you know, unicorn blood and pixie dust, keeping that thing running. It's really completely insane. And that was true with Sun Microsystems. They were doing such incredible, incredible work that, um, you know, you don't necessarily always trust the computer to do what you think, and especially if the computer's been on for a very long time. It's like, oh, just restart your computer and everything will... It's like, no, we want a computer that's just going to run forever and, and, and be very good. And so ZFS is all about storing files and having impeccable data integrity and doing it with basically commodity hardware because we don't want to engineer custom hardware to be able to deal with this or even semi-custom hardware you know not to get sidetracked or or, or, or or waylaid for a second but we'll talk even at like a very microscopic level like physical mechanical rotating discs the sector size 512 bytes even that's not set in stone there are solutions like the IBM NetApp. I mean, you know, sort of famously, we did our 172 terabyte storage server video where I repurposed NetApp shelves. By default, the drives for those shelves come configured to store 520 byte sectors, not 512 byte sectors. And the reason for that is because extra checksum information is stored in the difference between 512 bytes and 520 bytes. The extra eight bytes store a checksum. And so the computer knows something has gone wrong if a mathematical relationship between the 512 bytes of information you actually want to store and then a computation based on that 512 bytes doesn't match. Spinning rust, I mean, it's like, how efficient do you think a record player is for, you know, uh, seeking and playing back music? You've got your, you know, you've, you've got your 300 pounds of plastic vinyl collection that has all of your music library on it and it's like i'm gonna i want to build a mixtape out of this it's like, without having tape how are you going to mix things together it's like well you could get more than one i guess and it's like you got to unload the record and plop it down and then you got to get the needle and you got to find the thing that's basically a hard drive a mechanical hard drive it's a it's a spinning platter of rust that is writing impossibly small ones and zeros to a spinning platter of rust 
and there's a physical read write head with a magnetic ceramic head on top of it that's going to those bits. I mean, it is, it is a, it is a fantastical Rube Goldberg machine of neodymium, copper, and data storage, and it is, it is a miracle that those even work. And so, Sun Microsystems facing, you know, that sort of mechanical challenge, and the, the drives lie. The drives lie a lot. They, they'll fail, and they're not know, they'll, they'll not know that they fail. Some company solutions with that whole 520 byte sector thing. So you write a piece of data, but then you take that data and use it as a computation. It doesn't matter if it's image data or document data or text data, it doesn't matter. You run that data through some type of computation. It gives you a number and depending on the algorithm, it can be fantastically good at detecting that something has changed, something is wrong. And so that is sort of the building block, that check summing process is sort of the building block of redundancy of knowing that something is wrong and so that's one of the cornerstones of the functionality in ZFS it does a lot of stuff ZFS is hugely complicated so the other thing to keep in mind with mechanical hard drives when ZFS was designed you know flash memory wasn't really a thing and there was not really anything between you know memory like RAM which is very fast and this you know Rube Goldberg spinning rust contraption which is quite slow by computational standards and since Sun Microsystems which we're talking about like the 90s and early 2000s computers processors uh, the processors and computers RAM storage other kinds of storage other than mechanical hard drives have gotten exponentially faster I mean 5 billion cycles per second just you know uh, tens of gigabytes or hundreds of gigabytes or thousands of gigabytes per second for different levels of memory that come off the processor, things have gotten insanely fast. Good old fashioned mechanical desktop hard drive from, you know, a hundred gigabyte mechanical hard drive from like 10 years ago, you could read information off of that thing at about a hundred megabytes per second. Nice new modern eight terabyte mechanical hard drive, you can read information off of that at about 200 megabytes per second. So we've gone from, you know, a hundred gigabytes to 18 terabytes and we've increased our transfer speed from 100 megabytes per second to about 200 megabytes per second wait a minute the aerial density of information on this on this rust bucket has gone from 100 gigabytes to 18 terabytes and you mean to tell me we've only doubled the speed yeah pretty much um nvme hard drives you know solid state flash hard drives those are in the thousands of megabytes per second the several thousands of megabytes per second, so 200 megabytes per second. And this is the best case scenario, is uh, quite slow. Uh, and remember, get that read right head, the needle, you wanna read in two songs at once, that ain't happening, unless the drive wastes all of its time bouncing back and forth between two different things. So while the computer is waiting on the hard drive to do stuff, there is a lot of computational horsepower available. That's what Sun sort of took advantage of with ZFS is like, hey, these mechanical hard drives, even if we got a billion of them, are very slow. And so we actually have a lot of opportunity to do computations as we're looking for information. Now, the other really big advantage of ZFS that sort of comes out of that is the fact that ZFS has underlying knowledge of how the disks in your storage pool are arranged. It's really designed with more than one mechanical hard drive in mind and most file systems are not and so like a file system is like you you have a device you have like a flash drive and you format the flash drive to use it i feel like that's a process that everybody's familiar with the deal with zfs though is that it knows that this single device on its own is probably unreliable and so it's designed to operate with multiple physical pieces of hardware in a way that it sort of exploits the fact that one of these devices may be lying on an individual piece of data level like at the sector level although it doesn't do it by storing it does do it by storing extra information but it tries to do it in as efficient a way as possible um, and i'll come back to that in a second but it sort of wants the information to be striped across multiple devices because you get into inefficiencies if you do it any other way See, if I, have a, if I have a piece of hardware that is designed to store redundant and checksumming information along with the actual storage of the, the information, then there's not really a performance penalty. But if we go back to our 512 byte sector mechanical disks, suppose I want to store an extra checksum, that extra 8 bytes. Well, 
the smallest amount of information a mechanical hard drive can deal with is 512 bytes. So if I want to store an extra eight bytes of checksum, I've actually got to do two 512 byte writes, 512 bytes for the data, and then I've got to put that other eight bytes somewhere else. So that's wildly inefficient. And that's true with pretty much everything. They didn't, there's not really, like commercially, the people that make these types of mechanical storage devices are like, hmm, we can charge a lot more for that 520 byte capability if we sell it to enterprises and server people. So we've got this one piece of hardware that for the home user that's looking for 512 bytes, they can buy it for this much. But somebody that's gonna buy it in the commercial space, they're gonna pay twice as much or three times as much or five times as much. This is the IBM model. Hey, NetApp, we're back to NetApp. That's how NetApp works. You know, the NetApp storage appliances, like, wow, we'll do 520 bytes. We'll do all of the engineering and everything necessary to make these things deal with 520 byte sectors. And so we've got 512 bytes and you know, it's backward compatible if anything needs direct access, but we can also store our checksum information. ZFS, you know, Sun sort of saw the writing on the wall. They sort of was writing on the wall of where Google would be. Because like Google's computers, their compute infrastructure was literally made out of garbage. They just had motherboards laying on cardboard and, you know, but philosophically, you didn't want to do things like that. You wanted to buy like really expensive 5.9, super reliable hardware. Google was like, we're going to literally run our stuff on garbage and we're going to have software say, oh, that machine burst into flames and caught on fire. Well, eject it from the cluster and let's just continue computing. Meh, doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, this was just heretical, heretical thinking. And so ZFS kind of treats mechanical storage that way. You get a mechanical hard drive, it's gonna store information, it might lie to you. You've got a pool of say four mechanical hard drives. ZFS has mechanisms in it where it will try to stripe the write, like if you've got a lot of information that you wanna write, it'll try to keep all four disks busy, but it'll try to do it in such a way that it's not a, a wasting a lot of IO storing the extra checksum information, but also is taking advantage of the fact that you can divvy up that workload and get up to a theoretical performance bump of up to four times. Um, the problems that you run into with ZFS, I will come back to because it's not always a perfect abstraction. When you're just doing a, a regular flash disk like this and you want to format it, the file system really doesn't know how to deal with multiple physical devices. That doesn't work well. You need a file system that's really complicated where the software for the file system is really complicated so that it can deal with multiple physical devices. Um, a traditional RAID controller, like you may have seen a RAID controller, uh, and a RAID controller is just a physical PCIe card that then your drives plug into that. But it's really just a computer on a card. You, it's a computer within a computer. It's turtles all the way down. So that computer within a card is doing some extra calculations and it's doing some extra computations and it's storing some extra information, maybe theoretically possibly, uh, on the, the drives that you write to in hopes that things will... Uh, fail in a predictable way. The problem is, and I've shown in this in very, very ancient videos, is most RAID controllers really don't do a lot to store extra information. In the case of a RAID 1, for example, it's a perfect mirror. In a RAID 1 configuration, the RAID controller is storing a perfect mirror of drives. And the assumption from system administrators is that if they remove the RAID controller from the equation and just plug one of the drives in the mirror, in it will continue to work normally so the raid controller really can't do anything to manipulate the file system or store any extra checksum information beyond what the file system might support and newsflash most file systems don't support storing a lot of extra redundant you know checksum information or anything to know that the information that the drive is returning is correct so you could have a hardware raid controller with a raid one mirror two physical drives that have two physical pieces of information and, uh, you know, let's say that you've got a document, you're working on your document, your, your big presentation, and you save it and you come back the next day and you load it and it's corrupt. You could still actually have a copy of your presentation that is not corrupt on the other hard drive in the mirror. The problem is there's not a hardware RAID controller on the market that will tell you which one of those files is correct. And actually it gets into data forensics where you send both drives and the 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 raid card off to a data recovery place and they'll image both drives looking for differences and then a human operator will literally pick different combinations of things to try to find a file that's a valid format or, or something like that and the reason for that is because again the format that the raid card uses is not proprietary it doesn't store extra information if it did the performance would tank because of the whole 
512 byte sector thing. So uh, it gets a little more complicated when you talk about RAID 5. It's not until RAID 6 that controller, the RAID, hardware RAID controllers actually have a leg to stand on in terms of figuring out who's lying. And the reason for that is because with RAID 6 you have extra redundancy information. You don't just have redundancy information, you have two sets of redundancy information on two different drives. So in the case of returning, you know, I've got my presentation file, and instead of my presentation file living intact in a mirror on two physical devices, in a rate in a minimum RAID 6 configuration, it's four drive four drives, um, I would be in a situation where uh, my file is broken up into two chunks and there's two bits of redundancy information spread across all four drives. And if one of the drives is lying, it's possible to use the information on the other three drives to figure out which drive is lying, and it's possible for the RAID controller to return to me the corrected file, the file that has the corrected information by assembling those you know, four chunks, figuring out which chunk is bad, tossing that chunk, maybe throwing an error and saying, hey, the information's there, and sending it on. Four drives, incidentally, is also uh, the minimum drive configuration for RAID 10. RAID 10 is great because it gives you both high performance and high IOPS, but the problem with RAID 10, as it's implemented on every hardware RAID controller that I've ever tested, is that it doesn't know when one drive, like when one drive gets corrupt or out of sync with the other drives, it doesn't know which drive is lying and which drive has which drive has bad information and which drive has good information but with raid 6 it's possible to compute that and of course if you have a 6 raid or a 10 drive raid 6 uh, it is possible to compute that a lot of raid controllers implement a function called patrol read and patrol read all that does is just scan to look for inconsistencies and in the case of my raid 1 inconsistency depending on how it's inconsistent when it encounters that inconsistency where one of the drives has a correct working presentation file and the other drive does not for whatever hardware failure reason on that particular drive it is possible that the inconsistency will be corrected to corrupt my presentation depending on which drive the controller goes with so if the if the drive itself throws an error Sometimes that's a clue for the RAID controller. So like if the drive tells the controller, hey, I'm not feeling so good. Uh, I'm going to return data, but you know, I'm also generating some errors. Then some RAID controller firmware will say, okay, this drive has thrown errors. Let's maybe not use the data from it. Let's use the data from the other drive in the case of a RAID 1 mirror. And so it may just the slightest error. It may eject that drive. But then again, it may not. Then again, the, the drive may not report to the RAID controller that it is failing. Philosophically, ZFS is a completely different situation. Philosophically, ZFS does not trust anything to operate correctly, and it especially does not trust hard drives to operate correctly. It does not trust hard drives to self-diagnose. Hard drive can be a silent carrier. It could be, you know, infected, but asymptomatic, as it were. And uh, <laughs> so ZFS is constantly challenging the drives and the information that's on the drives mathematically with that checksum. And so ZFS is unique because it is a file system really, but it also manages the volume. So like the introducing some new terminology here, but the volume management is really the volume that your data is stored in, which is across a whole bunch of disks. And so the file system is aware of how the disks are physically laid out and how many disks there are and that kind of thing. And you think about the the other scenario that I was describing with a RAID array and you've got, you know, multiple mechanical hard drives and they're presented to the computer, uh, to the host computer, as one large device that can store information. And so when you format it as, you know, NTFS or EXT2 or, you know, your Linux, Mac OS, whatever, um, the file system doesn't know there's, a, there's multiple physical drives involved. Whereas with ZFS, it does know that there's multiple physical drives involved. So ZFS is handling redundancy because you can tell it how redundant you want it to be. Uh, there's RAID Z1 where one drive can suffer a failure. RAID Z2, RAID Z3, up to three drives can suffer a failure. RAID also has straight mirroring, or ZFS also has straight mirroring. The difference is that ZFS does actually store extra checksumming information with its mirroring, so it will know when a mirror is lying. Of course, the penalty for that is I.O. You have extra I.O. that you have to deal with in order to uh, enjoy that 
level of redundancy, that, that level of reporting. And also, not a lot of operating systems support, you know, is, is guaranteed to support ZFS. Although at this point in history, we have pretty decent support for ZFS on Windows. It's It was going to be a Mac OS thing, and then, you know, Oracle did some saber rattling and Apple sort of canceled, including ZFS. But ZFS was going to be the next gen Mac OS file system, from what I understand. And of course, Linux has ZFS on Linux, which is quite good. And FreeBSD is sort of the first citizen for ZFS because, you know, ZFS has a billion dollars of development, probably more software development, engineering time into it. It is an incredible file system, but with that comes a lot of overhead. So because ZFS has all this useful stuff built in, like checksumming, and it's aware of your physical disks, and it can manage volumes, and there, ZFS also has this concept called data sets, where you can create a data set on the file system, and it's kind of like a volume on LVM, like a sub-volume, but you can actually change some of the parameters about how it works with compression, that kind of thing. There's a lot of features in ZFS, things like deduplication, although that adds, makes it even slower and adds more overhead and generally you shouldn't use that unless you have a lot of memory and you're building a de dedicated storage appliance, but you can do things like deduplication on and off, not on a global level, but on a data set level. A data set is just like a, a slice of your storage, but it's not as hard as a partition. So you might have heard about, you know, you can take a disk and partition it up into thirds and you're sort of hard set that you know, this, this partition is a third, this partition is a third, this partition is a third. With ZFS and, and most other modern logical volume managers, LVM on Linux or LVM2, um, it works that you can just say, I need three buckets. And depending on how much stuff is in each bucket, it just will, the, the underlying storage mechanism will just take care of putting that wherever it needs to and to get everything to fit. So if you have three buckets, but by the time you're actually filling up your storage medium, one of the buckets is twice as big as the other two buckets, that's okay. You don't have to decide that ahead of time with most modern logical volume managers and with ZFS. So that's all the cool stuff about ZFS and that's why it's kind of different because it's file system and volume manager and, and device manager sort of all rolled into one. But that also brings some downsides. Like for ZFS to do its fancy recovery thing, you can't really add a single disk at a time to your storage pool and ZFS really works best when you have more than a single disk. If you have a single disk with ZFS it can only tell you that the data is corrupt somehow and you might not be able to get it back. Like it there's there may not be you know extra redundancy information on the on the disk to, to recover your information. You might have some like depending on your setup I don't want to say universally you're not going to be able to recover it but it's a bad situation if you have a single disk it's formatted with ZFS, and ZFS is telling you, hey, I'm getting data corruption. And you might be wondering, it's like, how much of a problem really is silent data corruption? It's not an insanely huge problem, but it definitely can occur. And you've probably experienced it and not even realized it. So like if you have a large photo or movie collection or an MP3 collection that you've had for years, decades maybe, and you know, all of a sudden one day you notice that one of your songs cuts off or you're, you know, looking at a really old picture and like half the picture is fine and then the other half of the picture is like messed up noise and weirdness. That's bit rot. You, you got file corruption in your storage media. Some device was like, yeah, here's your file. Here's what you gave me. And it's like, why is there coffee stains and just terribleness on this? Oh, I don't know. You gave it to me like that. It's like, no hard drive. I didn't do that. So you don't necessarily notice until you go to load the thing again and look at it and be like, that's not what that should be. With ZFS, you get an early warning that something bad has happened and you need to deal with it. That's uh, uh, called ZFS scrubbing. And by default, that's a scheduled process that happens weekly. Uh, and generally it, it goes quite fast. I mean, it's just how long it takes to scan your, your data. Now, if we're talking about 18 terabyte hard drives that are only 200 megabytes per second, you know, you do the math. It takes a while to get through 18 terabytes to 200 megabytes per second. So, uh, you know, depending on how often your data changes and some other parameters, uh, scanning once a month might be, you know, more appropriate as opposed to once a week because it takes a while to get through 18 terabytes at 200 megabytes per second. Sometimes you see ZFS compared with other file systems. There are file systems like BTRFS or ButterFS. And ButterFS, you know, philosophically wants to try to address some of the same things as ZFS. But bottom line, ZFS is much more mature than 
BTR fest. And uh, that's going to get down votes and people are going to complain about that. But it's the truth. BTRFS is nice because it is less overhead than ZFS. And in some scenarios, it can be much faster than ZFS. But generally, if you care about your data integrity, ZFS has been better in my experience. Uh, BTRFS has, uh, you know, historically had some fairly famous bugs around RAID 5 and RAID 6. They were not super well tested. A lot more development effort should have gone into uh, unit testing and integration testing or writing automated tests to run through uh, gigabytes, if not terabytes, of actual integration testing and failure simulation to be sure that the code worked correctly. ZFS has most, if not all, of those test fixtures in their development pipeline. BTRFS might be nice someday, but it's not quite there. There are some rough edges with ZFS and ZFS on Linux, things like in order for that checksumming, that extensive checksumming to go fast, you need access to the processor that the Linux kernel uh, does not necessarily provide the cleanest access to in, you know, for modules and things like that. There's a little bit of a kerfuffle about that recently. And so performance, you know, may or may not be there. With very high speed devices, like NVMe devices, especially if you have an NVMe array, ZFS hasn't caught up yet. Remember, ZFS was developed in the 90s and 2000s when mechanical storage was glacial in comparison. I mean, remember, just super, super slow compared to how fast everything else has gotten in the computer. Mechanical storage is still just terrible. Um, ZFS is catching up, but it hasn't quite caught up there. It doesn't have anybody, you know, spending an insane amount of money on R&D that's giving away for free. I mean, Oracle might have some really amazing solutions here, but the open source stuff, not so much. So it can be faster to run like Linux LVM plus some of the other stuff versus just ZFS on, on NVMe. You can totally run ZFS on NVMe or RAID 1, well, at RAID Z1 of NVMe, uh, you know, mirroring, um, ZFS mirroring on NVMe. ZFS mirroring on NVMe is very fast. L much less overhead than RAID Z. Still not as fast as other file systems. Definitely not as fast as ext4 because it doesn't have as many features. So there you go. I've done some other videos on this like setting up RAID on Ubuntu and setting up RAID on Arch Linux and setting it up with uh, MD admin which is like the old school way of doing it and also Linux's LVM2. Red Hat has put a lot of work into LVM, the Logical Volume Manager for Linux. And in the Logical Volume Manager, it now supports RAID properly. So you can create a volume, you can take a bunch of disks and assign those disks to be storage medium in LVM. And then you can tell LVM, I want this volume to have this level of redundancy, kind of like RAID, and LVM will handle that for you. And so you can get RAID 6 type functionality uh, which has a very low performance penalty overhead for the checksumming that it does because it's doing that It's doing the writes in such a way that you don't end up with extra writes To the device that you're storing information on that that parity information ends up being stored uh, On the 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 IO operation for that parity ends up going to a specific device So there's not as much of a performance penalty overall for dealing with that type of thing but all of that raid stuff and LVM that's really the subject of a different video, and I've done those. You can check that out if you, if you need more information. But hopefully that sort of gives you a really kind of high-level understanding of what ZFS is and what it does. Basically, you know, in a nutshell, ZFS combines file system management and volume management and device management, but also data management in terms of no matter what you give it, when it gives you back something, it will make sure that what it's giving you is what you gave it mathematically. Otherwise it will fail. It will say, I don't know, you gave me a thing. This is what it should be. I don't have it. It's broken. There's there are devices here. The pool is degraded, restore from a backup. I can't give you what you gave me. I've made sure of that mathematically. The chances of it failing in such a way as to return bad data and not know that it's bad uh, is, a, <laughs> is a, a near mathematical impossibility. So, uh, you know, the computer, 
you know, computers barely work. If they didn't work at all, then maybe. But because they barely work and because of the, the structure that's set up here, if something is going wrong mechanically, ZFS will let you know. And it's not unique in that capability, but it is so hardened and it, is, it has so much engineering time. It has so much developer love put into it over the years for you know, not the open source community, but like as a commercial product that I feel confident in trusting it with any data where I care about the data and I want the data forever. And it's not a substitute for backups or anything like that. Although it does have a lot of features where if you want, if you have your stuff stored in a ZFS pool, you have a remote ZFS pool somewhere else, there are tons of helpful things built into the file system to send only the changed parts from the local ZFS system to the remote ZFS system. Son, they really did think of everything. Um, and they did well. They did, you know, imagine Google level IQs and engineers working on this stuff 10, 20 years before Google. And that was Sun. It's like, we didn't, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have bozos on YouTube waxing poetic about, oh, this is amazing. But that's why, you know, that's why Sun enjoys the, uh, you know, cult hacker, super amazing, uh, legendary status that it does because ZFS is not the only technology that Sun came up with that is like this, where it's just like, this is, you know, some sort of crazy alien technology literally right out of Star Trek because it's so insane. This has been 30 minutes of an introduction into ZFS, but if you find yourself wanting more or you use ZFS for your day job, definitely check out the books by Jude and Lucas, um, ZFS and Advanced ZFS. There's a lot of hard-won battle knowledge in there, and they are well worth the price. You should, if you're just even going to use... ZFS in your home lab, it's worth having these books on your shelf. And Wendell, this is level one. This has been a level one explanation. Uh, I guess it probably should go on the Linux channel. Let's do that. Thanks again to our patrons and our Floatplane subscribers. They make this kind of content possible. And also, maybe I can get a haircut in a week or two. Starting to open things back up here. Mm, will I chance it?